Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 2022 Watershed Action Alliance Legislative Breakfast. My name is Sarah Grady. I am the watershed ecologist for the North and South Rivers Watershed Association and the South Shore Regional Coordinator for the Massachusetts Bay's National Estuary Partnership. The Watershed Action Alliance is a group of watershed groups uh, in the southeastern Massachusetts that work to protect and improve the health of the waterways and watersheds of the region for people, wildlife, and the environment. We would like to thank our sponsors, which include many of our member organizations, in addition to the Island Foundation, as well as our legislative sponsors, Senator Sear and Senator Feeney. What's going to be happening today is that each of uh, the italic uh, member organizations are going to be presenting a little bit about their uh, organizations, their successes and concerns, as well as uh, their top funding needs. There are fact sheets available. Um, on Sarah, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Sarah. I think you're on the, the wrong slide. Um, okay, hang on. Are you looking at the watersheds right now? We're looking at the map of the, the map. We're looking at okay. slide two. Okay. Um, that's okay. Um, the, what's there, um, there are fact sheets available on the Watershed Action Alliance website. And uh, you can read about each of our priorities as well as our funding concerns um, through those fact sheets. We'd also like to remind you that after the legislative breakfast is over, there's going to be a 45 minute training on speaking to legislators. So um, now I would like to, um, I would like to welcome um, our legislators to our legislative breakfast. Um, we're going to be hearing today from Senator Feeney as well as uh, Senator Sear. Let's see. So I just have to move some things around here. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, Senator Feeney is uh, represents the uh, Bristol and Norfolk district and has served on uh, multiple committees. He's the Senate chair of the Joint Committee on Bonding, Capital Expenditures and State Assets and the vice chair, of the Joint Committee on Consumer Protection and Professional, Professional Licensure. Um, and uh, he is a leading advocate for uh, the homeless and um, for uh, his local union, IBW2222 um, in Boston. Um, and uh, with that, I would like to um, introduce Senator, uh, Senator Feen. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> I hope you can all hear me okay. And I apologize uh, at the onset for my, my voice. I'm participating in the great American pastime of suffering from springtime allergies uh, with this tree pollen. Uh, and it, it has hit me quite hard uh, over the last couple of days, but it's a great sign of, um, of the changing of the season. So uh, it's great to be with you all this morning. I really appreciate the opportunity to come on. Um, I, I, you know, I looked forward to hosting this just a couple of years ago in person and, and at the state house. And of course the rug got pulled out from, from under all of us, uh, with the pandemic, <clears throat> but to be able to join even in this, uh, you know, in this virtual way is important for us to continue these conversations and, you know, hopefully sometime soon we can see while at the state house, it is open and we hope to see everybody circling through at some point. Um, but it's a pleasure to join you. And I also want to give a shout out as I'm sitting here this morning, of course, some of the advantages of doing this virtually, uh, I am about, as I look out the window, a half a mile from the headwaters of the Naponta River. <clears throat> so I want to give a special shout out <clears throat> to NEPRA, uh, my watershed association here in the area, uh, to Kerry, to Ian, uh, and to thank you for all the work that you're doing here locally and, and throughout my district. Uh, the important work that you do every day does not go unnoticed, and I know it has been a challenge um, for all of you, but uh, especially for those of us in this area. 
Um, and, and as I talk about that, you know, being here in Foxborough and again at the headwaters in the Ponce River, I think about it quite frequently as I sit in my uh, roughly two hour commute into Boston most days into the state house. And I leave my house and, you know, finally get up on the expressway. And as I go past Keystone, uh, see the mouth of the Neponsa River and wonder if it would have been quicker to just paddle my way uh, into Boston as opposed to driving on the expressway. So maybe someday we'll get to a point where um, that can be a reliable mode of transportation as you see me trying to paddle down the Neponsa River into, into the state house. Um, but it is great to see you all. You know, when we gathered together the last time in person, uh, I had the opportunity to share a personal story. Uh, for those of you that have that have heard it in the past, I apologize for being repetitive. Um, but it really is a driver for me in public service. <clears throat> Excuse me. And something that I want to mention, because although we're talking about water in a, in a very different way uh, with our watershed um, areas and, and certainly our rivers and streams, um, I, you know, I think it's all about connectivity and connecting, um, you know, this valuable resource and, and, and what it means to our own lives. <clears throat> when I was a young guy, I was in middle school, I think, and my parents, uh, my parents bought their first home. They had worked, you know, blue collar jobs and had saved their money and, and, and bought their home out in Central Mass. I grew up in Boston and, and they had this bright idea to move me out into the middle of Central Mass. And um, <clears throat> they bought their home. They had just had my younger brother. Um, he was an infant and really, you know, the American dream, right? buy this home, you had a, a, you know, acre plus uh, of land, middle of a beautiful area. <clears throat> and that dream turned into a nightmare relatively quickly when my parents received a letter from our town's public health department. They were doing random well sampling in the area and we had a private well and they found out that our well was um, absolutely um, riddled with carcinogens. It was uh, full of all sorts of chemicals that came from engine cleaning solvents from a nearby business that was dumping, knowingly dumping these, these solvents into a crack storage container underground. And for years, <clears throat> nobody did anything about it. The result of that was that it contaminated the entire water table, not only through my neighborhood, um, through many of the private wells that existed in our, in our immediate area, uh, right up and right up to a, a local pond that was probably you know not even a half mile away, and the tough part for me was that uh, you know in watching what my parents were going through and understanding that many many people knew uh, that this was happening on a certain level, but that nobody ever did anything about it. <clears throat> if they figured that it would just go away, that it wouldn't be a problem, we learned fairly quickly how much of a problem it was. Uh, we were told to immediately cease and desist drinking any of the water that came out of our tap to limit skin exposure to just five minutes per person per day, um, that it was a real issue. And then we had to go for many, many tests and blood tests and all sorts of stuff that you don't want to have to go through with a young family. But it really was a reminder as they bought this house and, and you know, really sunk their entire life savings into and in sweat equity into this home, um, that things can change on a dime because of uh, issues in our environment. And it was, um, it was a difficult experience for my family. <clears throat> they organized with the neighborhood to try and get the ground cleaned up, to try and get public drinking water into the area, to try and clean up the pond uh, in, the, in the area surrounding the pond. Um, but it was, uh, they were successful in, in, in some ways and unsuccessful in other ways. Um, but it really has become a driver for me, as I said, in my public service and, you know, trying to be a, uh, an environmental steward and, you know, to do what I can in the Massachusetts Senate so that other families don't have to go through that. But really, again, like I said, recognizing the connectivity between our drinking water and our rivers and waterways. And, and, and um, you know, it's been, um, it's been a good opportunity for me to be able to share that story uh, because I know it's not, it's not necessarily unique. There are many, many people that have to deal with that and families that have to deal with that and be plunged into this world that really um, they never thought that they would find themselves in like my family. So, <clears throat> but I, I bring up that story um, again, not only to, you know, let you know kind of what spurred me into public service. There are many things, but that was certainly top on the list. Um, but, but also to, to get you to think a little bit, you know, what is your, um, what is your why, right? Why do you do what you do? Why do you go through the challenges of trying to meet with legislators? And I know sometimes banging your head against the wall, uh, with us and, and administrators 
to try and get us to recognize some of these issues, whether they are emergent, you know, important issues that need to be dealt with right away, or whether we need to think long term uh, about many of the things that you're all working on. And whether it's drinking water, agricultural needs, uh, ecological and wildlife preservation, recreation, climate adaptation, sustainable development, uh, or all the above. My advice to you, and I know you're going to be talking to many of my colleagues, uh, my advice to you when you're advocating for, for policy and resources is to start with your heart. Start with your heart. Make the pitch with your head and then always end with the ask. And I say that I know many of you are professionals at, um, at, at, at shaking the trees and, and doing what you can to advocate. But I just, you know, as, as kind of a reminder, as you're talking to my colleagues, um, the most compelling case that you can make is that personal story, what it means to you, um, why you do what you do. Uh, every time I talk to somebody, and I see many people on this call that I've had some incredible conversations with, when you start with your heart, when you start with your why, um, it really is compelling and it's difficult for legislators to say no in that scenario. Um, so with that said, and I know you're gonna be doing a lot of that work and I know we have a speed dating round coming up in just a moment. I don't wanna take too much of your time, but I wanna take just a moment to highlight a few of the things that are kind of, that are on my radar screen, things that I've been working with, um, working on with my colleagues and my staff. Um, I know that this is a focus of your work. I know you have a uh, comprehensive legislative agenda, which I applaud you for. There are some great pieces of legislation in that. But there's a couple of things, too, that I just want to bring up and, and, and ask for your guidance, um, of course, and your assistance as we move the ball uh, downfield with these issues as well. We're trying to address some, some real pressing issues, and I have one in particular uh, that has been really bothering me now for a while, actually since the day that I got sworn into the Senate. Um, looking for a way that we can address this differently and kind of have a paradigm shift in our thinking. Uh, and that is the issue of dams. We have a dam problem in Massachusetts and, and we need to find a dam solution. Um, and I apologize for the, for the pun, but uh, I mean it. We, you know, this is, this is something that's been on my mind and, and I know on the minds of many of you. Uh, again, shout out to NEPRA for the work that they've been doing here locally uh, around this issue. But as a Commonwealth for decades, we have taken an approach that has been all about kind of band-aids and, and kicking the can down the road uh, when it comes to our dams, nibbling around the edges and avoiding disaster, but only barely uh, in many instances. Our collective mindset regarding, I think it's over 3,000 dams in Massachusetts must change and catch up with present day reality. I know this is something that many people on this Zoom this morning have been raising up the flagpole for us and policymakers and regulators for, for many, many years, and I thank you for that. But the truth is that the overwhelming majority of these dams, whether they're owned by the Commonwealth, municipalities, or private owners, serve absolutely no useful purpose anymore and only stand in the way, figuratively and, and quite literally, uh, of our natural waterways. And I wanna be careful not to paint with too broad of a brush because I know in many of your areas across the Commonwealth and, and, and especially in the Southeastern part of the state uh, and even in my own district, you know, there are some instances where, where damp bodies of water are preferred for a variety of reasons, right? And, and you know, it's not a one size fits all, <clears throat> excuse me. However, the clear majority um, of, of these dams are in some stage of disrepair, potentially failing, dangerous to downstream downstream inhabitants, which we know um, clearly and inhibitive of fish migration and other natural growth. Uh, we're seeing some work being done in, in Norwood to, to restore that. And I think we can do it elsewhere across, across our region. As we deal with climate change, our failing dams must be a priority. The old, you know, once in a 100 year uh, catastrophic storm is now realistically once in a 50 year or, or once in a 25 year reality, we know that. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I bring this up because we really do have an opportunity today as we sit here with the increased resources in state and federal, um, from the state and federal government. The federal government, as we know, uh, is absolutely carpet bombing Massachusetts with funds for many, many different things. Some of that money has been earmarked towards dams. Uh, I know federally with the federal infrastructure package, I think it was almost $3, $3 billion, I think was the final uh, result of that in the federal infrastructure bill. But I wanna make sure that we're continuing to advocate here strongly in Massachusetts. And I ask you to do so as well, so that we don't lose focus on this issue. We don't go back to the status quo in, in, in dealing with our dams the way that we've been doing it for so many years. 
um, we need to earmark significant spending to the work of dismantling and, and again, not band-aiding like we've been doing for many, many years, many of these dams across the state before it's too late. Let's restore these waterways to its natural state. Let's make sure that we're not inhibiting fish migration. Let's make sure that we're protecting inhabitants from downstream disaster um, and really dedicate the money that we have now in this small window of available resources so that we can actually go in and make a difference for generations to come. The time is now. This will be a focus and a priority of me going forward. And again, I ask for your assistance and cooperation in doing that. Uh, additionally, you know, we've been we've been talking a lot about um, about dams uh, in my office, but one of the things that uh, you've all been working on, and I know has been uh, an issue of discussion across the state and across the legislature, is around PFAS. Right? We know there's been a lot of attention around PFAS in our groundwater and our watershed areas, and for good reason. Right? We know that these are forever chemicals. And our response has to be swift and widespread. We're certainly leading here in Massachusetts uh, in setting our own um, parts per trillion uh, metric here in the Commonwealth. It's caused a lot of concern amongst municipalities who are worried that they're not going to have the resources to be able to deal with this. So instead of pushing back um, or instead of allowing a system where they push back and say, look, we just don't have the resources. This is not something we can do. The state should be doubling down on this. And we are. Um, we need to be leading on this to make sure that all these rising levels that we see in our communities, uh, around our waterways, in our um, public and private wells, that, that we're dealing with that in a way um, that, that uh, municipalities and, 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 and you know, private owners and organizations and nonprofits have the ability and the resources that they need to continually monitor, to test and when needed to mitigate uh, those PFAS chemicals. Mm -hmm. We've seen um, you know, a, a, an influx of, of incoming from municipalities about uh, wells and making sure that we were um, dedicating resources and money to the uh, installation of new wells. But it's something that's gonna be an ongoing issue. Uh, we can't nibble around the edges on this one. It has to be a significant spend. And in Massachusetts, as I said, we're leading the way, but I just wanna make sure that we don't lose sight of that. Um, we are taking steps at the state house to address this. Um, we created a PFAS interagency task force to review and investigate water and ground contamination of PFAS across the Commonwealth and to make recommendations for Massachusetts action, um, whether it's through legislation or regulation, you know, we need to know exactly how to fix this problem going forward. Uh, recently in the, the debate around the American Rescue Plan, uh, which has been um, timely for us and, and much needed uh, money coming from the federal government. But we had a debate in the, in the uh, ARPA, um, you know, Senate around the ARPA spend, where we allocated $100 million for water and sewer infrastructure, right? That's important. That's a good down payment. It's, it's certainly not the be all end all. Um, but as we continue to take another bite at the apple of the ARPA funding, to realize uh, additional infrastructure money coming in from the federal government, we should be spending this money um, for our water infrastructure. Um, the funding that we allocated in, in the initial ARPA uh, bill, we spent by the Clean Water Trust in the form of grants for water infrastructure projects, including PFAS remediation, uh, drinking water systems, wastewater pro uh, projects and, and the like. Um, so we need to make sure that we're continuing to do that. It's not a standalone task. We know the connectivity between our waterways, our rivers, our streams, um, and, and certainly our drinking water in our communities. So um, it's an important piece that we're going to be continuing to, to work on going forward. And again, I would ask for your help and cooperation in that. And I know you're working on it uh, on, a day, on a daily basis. Finally, I just want to end with, with this and, and talk a little bit about a, a success that, um, that we've had recently in my own district and something that I hope can become a model across the Commonwealth. You know, the work that you do every single day in, in protecting our waterways uh, is vital, but I think it goes unnoticed by a lot of uh, a lot of just kind of regular people who are getting up every day, taking the kids to school, going to work, get on that daily hamster wheel uh, of life, and sometimes they don't realize the work that's going on around us, uh, especially when it comes to our environment and protection um, of our water resources. And you know, here in Foxborough, um, you know, certainly years ago when I was on the the select board, um, I became uniquely aware. Of many of those issues again just being uh, down the road from the Neponset Reservoir about what years and years of um, you know dumping of, of chemicals and, and certain factory work in the area uh, meant to our natural resources here. 
Um, but I don't think many people understand or have that sort of connection to, to the world around them and, and the world and the work that you're doing. They certainly enjoy the fruits of your labor. There's no doubt about it. Uh, whether it's taking a nature walk or, or walking through trails in their own community or in a nearby community, um, canoeing down a river, um, fishing, you know, whatever it may be, um, you know, however they choose to spend their time in, in, in you know, with their family and recreation. <clears throat> but there are things that we can do now so that we're not spending a lot of our time educating people about the importance of the issues that you're dealing with. You know, we have a, um, a gem of a preschool here in our district up in Sharon, um, the Cooperative Nature School up on, on Moose Hill Farm. If, if you're not familiar with it or aware of it, um, I'll, I can drop the link in the chat to the website um, and would love to have you stop by at some point. It's an incredible program, but imagine a preschool where EEC, fully EEC certified, your regular curriculum that you would see in any preschool, but they do it by also spending up to 50% of their day outside. Imagine, you know, from 3.9 to five-year-old children um, trying to corral them inside for a full day's worth of, of work is, is difficult and challenging. Um, but they take that to the next level. They actually take them outside and they incorporate the curriculum of being out in nature, going and studying vernal pools, going and studying nearby waterways and the, and the, and the, the flow of streams and what it means to the wildlife around them and to the environment around them. And they spend their days, again, 50% outside, whether it's rain, snow, sleet, shine, whatever it may be that the parents uh, make sure that they are, um, you know, well, well equipped and well dressed. And they go out and they learn and they learn in nature. And we've seen the effects, right? We've seen the effects of this, that when children learn outside, they not only, um, you know, they, they not only learn their basic core curriculum and the things that you would expect a preschooler to be learning, but they learn what it's about to be in, to be in, um, you know, uh, um, to be good environmental stewards, to be, to how to connect to the world around them, what the wildlife um, means to our communities and to our planet. And I think if we can, if we can, and we've been successful in, in securing earmarks for them over the last couple of sessions. Um, but again, you know, doing what we can with some discretionary funding. But imagine if we could replicate that across the Commonwealth. Imagine if we could take a model like that and say that our next generation of leaders, our next generation of leaders don't have to be educated on the issues of our environment and our waterways because they're already going to know because they learned in nature, because they learned walking trails, because they learned studying the species around them. They learned what it means uh, to be good stewards of our environment. Um, and again, I know that's not for everybody, but we're going to be working uh, certainly with the folks up at the co-op school in Sharon and others and my colleagues in the legislature uh, and hopefully you to figure out a way that we can replicate this so that it's not just a one-time program uh, it's not just a summer you know one week where, where you know a kid comes in and, and goes out and learns um, but it really is a, a, a you know a lifetime of learning a curriculum that happens outdoors and, and in nature so uh, we're going to be working on that and, and again I don't have the the answer to it um, but it's going to take some resources it's going to take some focus and it's going to take you uh, going up and, and advocating uh, as you always do. Um, so I, again, really want to thank you for all the work that you're doing. I could go on and on and on about the many different issues that, um, that we've been talking about and, and, and trying to work on. Uh, but I know you have a busy program. I invite you to reach out to me at any time. I can make sure that everybody has my contact information. We have an incredible delegation. I want to acknowledge Senator Sierra, who I know is going to be joining with you in just a little bit. Uh, Senator Sear has been a, a leader on so many issues in the state Senate, but representing the Cape and Islands especially has a, uh, a unique frame of reference um, into the issues that, that you're all dealing with. So uh, I want to applaud Senator Sear and, and thank him for his leadership. Thank you all uh, again for being here and the work that you do and invite you to advocate vociferously for, um, for the issues that are important to you. Remember, we're getting into our budget season and I know there's going to be certain asks that are, that are coming up. Um, Everybody else is up there banging on doors and calling us and emailing us. Don't ever be bashful to do the same. And I know you're not, um, but please, you know, use us as a resource uh, if you need help connecting with anybody. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get out and we'll do everything you can for our, our unique region of the state, um, which has, uh, you know, a lot of needs and, and, and ones that we can address not only in this budget, 
but there are other bills coming up, like I said, through a second round of, round of ARPA and federal infrastructure spending as well. So thank you again for all that you do. I cannot thank you enough for having this breakfast again this morning. It was my pleasure to host it, and I can't wait to do it again in person, uh, hopefully um, soon. So thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you, Senator Fiend. Thank you so much, Senator Feeney. All right, so before we get going and learn more about Senator Feeney's home watershed, as well as all of the others in the Watershed Action Alliance, we have a greeting and land acknowledgement from Melissa Ferretti of the Herring Ponds Wampanoag tribe. <laughs> Sarah, is this supposed to be playing? Uh, yes. Are you not hearing the audio? No, I don't think you turned it on, maybe. Or, and it's also just in the, um, not the preview. I don't know what the word is, but it's not, it's not presenting the full slide. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I just received this. So I, I, and it's in a different format than everybody else's. So just give me one second. All right, let's see. Um, okay. Samantha, while, while we're waiting for um, Sarah to get the video going, I saw that you had your hand up when Senator Feeney was speaking. Did you have something that you wanted to say? No, just that was me clapping. <laughs> oh, clapping. Right. Vociferously yeah. supporting what yes. Senator Feeney was saying. <laughs> Absolutely. In terms of the kids' uh, programs, of course, and the dam removals. Hold on one moment. I apologize. For the technical difficulties we've got, we've got a lot of a lot of moving pieces here and uh, lots of different formats so <laughs> so this All is right. while we're waiting to where this is toward save the bay save the bay runs a very robust um environmental ed program that reaches 15 to twenty thousand students a year and often in multiple touches too um so it's in the classroom it's out on the water it's in the field uh doing the kinds of things that senator feeney talked about so we're very happy to um to share that what we do and how we do it um, with you and anyone else who's interested. Right, we're gonna try this again here. Uh, okay, please let me know right away if you can't hear the audio once I share it. No, we're not hearing it. Seeing it, but not hearing it. Uh. To turn, I don't know if you turn on the audio when you do that. No. All right, hold on. I think I just fixed it. Sorry. I'm so sorry about this, everybody. All right. I had it. Just one moment. <laughs> Okay. Juanima Talbert, Matasalis, Melissa Ferretti, New Tomas, Sikonamako Pakwit, Kanatai, Patuxet, Borndale. What I have said to you in my beloved language is good morning. My name is Melissa Ferretti. I am from the Herring Pond tribe of Plymouth and Borndale. I've been asked to offer today's land acknowledgement. Today, 
land acknowledgements are used by Native peoples and non-Native people to recognize the first peoples of this land, those who are the original stewards of this place which we now live. Generally, I would only share this acknowledgement if I were on my own homelands. But with this digital world that we all live in now, we may all be on different lands and territories of different tribes. Today, I will share a broader and more condensed version of a much larger, more detailed land acknowledgement. Today, we give thanks to the sacred place, what is now called Massachusetts. This beautiful land that lies beneath your feet wherever in the state that you may be, is the traditional homeland of Native people. We have called this land home for thousands of years. Our ancestors are buried here, and our descendants can still be found living amongst you here today. The history of Massachusetts Colony is extremely complex. What happened here on these lands impacted all Native nations across New England and spread far and wide across this country and into the Canadian Maritime. The spread of colonization resulted in armed conflict, murder, assaults, enslavement, dispossession of land, and was a direct assault on all Native communities, cultures, and life ways. As we begin our event here today, may we never forget those first peoples of this land. Aho. All right, thank you so much, Melissa, for contributing that land acknowledgement. Now we are going to move on to the first of our Watershed Association presentations. Um, so we're going to begin with the Neponset River Watershed Association. Good morning. I'm Carrie Snyder and I'm with the Neponset River Watershed Association. And I just want to start out by thanking you all for attending today uh, to learn a bit more about who we are, what we do, and how we might be a resource for you and your districts. The Neponset River is approximately 30 miles long, uh, beginning right at Gillette Stadium and flowing up to enter Boston Harbor between Dorchester and Quincy. Uh, the river flows through portions of 14 cities and towns and is home to approximately 330,000 people. It's got a rich history, including 10,000 years of human habitation, and 375 years of industrialization, and it's the ancestral home of the Massachusetts tribes. The Watershed Association works on a variety of important issues, and today I'll highlight our work to prevent the degradation of water quality through polluted stormwater runoff, restoring connectivity of the river through habitat restoration, and conservation of the finite resource that is fresh water. Now, when we add hard surfaces like roads, sidewalks, and roofs, we prevent rain from soaking into the ground. Instead, we use storm drains to collect rain and snowmelt and direct it to a nearby stream. Importantly, that rainwater picks up a lot of really gross pollutants and dumps them directly into those nearby water bodies without any treatment in between. One of our most successful programs is the Neponset Stormwater Partnership. We bring together our watershed communities to come up with regional solutions, education, and outreach around stormwater management. And through the partnership, we aim to help towns develop effective policy and implement best management practices for managing polluted runoff. The Neponsa contains relics of its industrial past, including old and abandoned dams and other diversions. And these change the natural flow and landscape of the river. So every chance we get, we try to restore the river to its natural healthy state, which reduces flood risk and makes communities more resilient to climate change. One of our current projects is a partnership among NEPRA, the town of Norwood, private landowners, and the State Division of Ecological Restoration. The project will enhance trout habitat and water quality on the best remaining trout stream in Eastern Mass while reducing the risk of catastrophic flooding for downstream um, environmental justice neighborhoods. We also advocate for strong water conservation bylaws, installation of water sense water fixtures that improve um, efficiency of household and business businesses, and reasonable conditions for Water Management Act permits. We need to make sure that our future leaders understand the importance of environmental stewardship, including conser conserving water. 
We've partnered with science and art classes to engage students and provide experiences that helps them to understand how they can make a real difference. Our priority funding needs are primarily those that will benefit watersheds and municipalities across the Commonwealth. Cities and towns need help to increase their resilience to the impacts of climate change. We need investments in connections between people and our natural resources, and particularly in environmental justice communities. And we need to invest at least 1% of our state budget in environmental programs. Climate change is here. We've already seen increased flooding and increased high heat days and intense drought. This impacts humans, ecosystems, and the economy, particularly in environmental justice communities. In 2020, despite a stormwater system that worked as intended, we lost Norwood Hospital, and most of those services aren't coming back. Towns can't make the necessary adaptations on their own, and the state MVP program has been a vital resource. One of the wonderful things about the Neponset is its important recreational opportunities, which benefits public health and environmental stewardship. Communities who would benefit most from it, those who have been unduly burdened by inappropriate development, are often those most disconnected from the river, and we need to remedy that by improving access for all. Currently, only 0.62% of the state's operating budget is dedicated to protecting the environment. In the early 2000s, that was 1%, and we really need to get back to that, at least that level of prioritization. Environmental agency staff are stretched too thin, and we need to restore agency funding not only for our public health and safety, but also for our economy. What really makes the Neponset River Watershed Association special is its members and volunteers. We're a member-supported organization, and watershed associations across the state thrive when members are involved. Our work is so varied, there's always a project of interest, whether it's a river cleanup, an educational walk to learn about the animals and plants in the watershed, or helping with habitat restoration. So please get in touch with your local watershed association. Thank you. Thank you to Carrie and the Neponset. Um, now we are going to be moving. Uh, uh, so we started up here uh, in See, here we go. Start up here around Boston Harbor. And now we're going to move south to the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. <clears throat> mm. Sarah, we're we're not seeing anything on okay. on our screen. Okay, stop. I'm hang on. Okay. Hold on just one moment. I think there's two stairs going on. Yeah, hold on a moment. I can't figure out where it is. I can hear it very faintly in the background. <laughs> hold on, hold on one moment. Okay. Um, okay, let's see. I'm not, it's telling me my screen share is paused, so I'm not sure what that means. All right, hold on a moment. Let's see. Let's see. Your screen. Okay. Watershed. Okay. Hi, my name is Samantha Woods and I'm the director for the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. Our purpose is to protect our waters through education, outdoor engagement, and restoration projects in our watershed. The North and South Rivers Watershed encompasses 12 communities and we are the host of the Mouse Bay's National Estuary Partnership Program. Uh, this EPA funded program provides a regional staff person to support South Shore communities to protect, restore, and enhance their coastal habitats. You can see that on the right-hand map. What makes our rivers and watershed unique? Um, both of our rivers are designated as national na natural landmarks. 
uh, like Mount Greylock and Gay Head. And the entire North River is the only state's designated scenic protected river, which means that there's a protected area 300 feet from the banks of the North River that um, runs along its entire length in six communities. In 2020, the Division of Marine Fisheries closed over 600 acres of recreational harvested shellfish beds in our rivers after 30 years of work to open them. Uh, the reason was due to concerns over discharges from the Situate Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, also in 2020, we were um, told that the DCR, after decades of funding, was no longer going to fund the North River Protective Order. Um, Without this funding, the river's water quality, recreational use, and habitats are endangered, and their ability to be resilient in the face of a changing climate is diminished. Ben Franklin once said, we will only know the value of water when the well has run dry. I'm here to tell you that the streams are running dry and the fish are dying because of it. This is due to the overwithdrawal of water in the summertime, largely to supply water for irrigation. In the North and South Rivers watershed alone, we have more than 60 aging dams and culverts, many undersized, uh, preventing fish like herring and native brook trout from being able to access spawning grounds. Uh, these dams also dry up streams downstream, they accumulate sediment behind them, and they increase the risk of flooding and increase water temperatures. All of these negative impacts will only be exacerbated with a changing climate. Removing dams can be a win-win-win for public safety, reducing maintenance costs, and improving climate resiliency. Our top funding needs include uh, these four, North River Commission, uh, this upgrades to the Situate Wastewater Treatment Plant, um, funding, further funding for drinking water infrastructure and conservation, and climate resiliency funding. We particularly would like to ask for the re reinstatement um, or an earmark of $50,000 in the DCR budget for the North River Scenic Protective Order. Um, We'd also wish to make sure that there's funding uh, available for the Situate Wastewater Treatment Plant should it need to upgrade its treatment uh, in order to reopen over 600 acres of shellfish beds in our watershed. The town of Situate has been working on a project to raise their drinking water reservoir to increase drought resiliency, make the reservoir's dam flood proof, and install a fish ladder for river herring. In 2018, the estimated cost to make these improvements was $2 million. Um, in addition, many South Shore communities are at the limits of their drinking water supplies, are vulnerable to droughts, and are having serious impacts on surface waters and their ecology. Climate change is going to make these conditions even worse. And we feel strongly that we need funds to provide regional education, better water policies, and water conservation incentive programming. With more resources, we could hire a regional water conservation coordinator to work in our communities on the South Shore to increase water conservation efforts. Uh, we also have several specific projects, uh, removing dams at Temple Street and Veterans Park on the South River in Duxbury and Marshfield, along with Third Herring Brook in Norwell and Hanover. Um, and we also would like to, to support increased funding for the Municipal Vulnerability Program um, and asking you to help us make uh, nonprofits eligible for receiving MVP funds directly. Um, as you know, significant federal funding for infrastructure uh, projects are, are coming, and it provides us an incredible opportunity to get it right for the future, um, but only if those who are closest to our natural resources can help guide the projects. We hope we'll, you'll look to us as a resource during the development of the state's budget for how best to use these resources to make the most of this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to ensure our water infrastructure is built for a changing climate that protects people and wildlife. Thank you. Thank you, Sam and the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. Now, um, we are going to be continuing to move south. Um, so we start, we're at the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. Um, and we're going to move on to the Jones River Watershed Association.
Hello, I'm Pine Dubois of the Jones River Watershed Association, which is headquartered in the tidal estuary of the river in Kingston, Massachusetts. We have worked for 35 years to understand, restore, and protect the river's water quality and natural resources. Small by most standards, the seven and a half mile long Jones is, however, the largest river draining to Cape Cod Bay. The watershed is used by Duxbury, Pembroke, Plimpton, and Kingston for a groundwater supply. In addition, about 20% of the surface water in the main stem is exported to Brockton and Whitman and flushed down the Taunton River as indicated by the red arrow on the map. What makes the Jones River so special is its 80 foot deep glacial headwater, Silver Lake. But diversion of 10 million gallons a day by the city of Brockton impairs the lake and the river. First settled as part of Plymouth, Jones River Landing is the oldest operating boatyard in the country and restoration efforts in the river have restored the Jones as a cold water fishery. In 1905, Brockton built a 38 inch tall dam on the Jones River downstream of the Silver Lake outlet. The intention then was to raise the lake a foot and access that foot of water. But today Brockton takes eight to 10 million gallons a day and flushes it down the Taunton River. Removing in-river obstacles like this derelict dam at the head of Tide under Elm Street dramatically improved water quality and species access to riverine habitat as recognized by the CFR designation last year. The Jones has 12 main tributaries and many that are contributing to those. Its wetlands and forests provide essential habitat sustained by the Plymouth Carver Aquifer. JRWA works to reopen these habitats to native and migrating fish and importantly, the American eel, before these critical species are lost forever. After this meeting in 2020, JRWA was able to secure a grant from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to support the installation of a novel BK fish ladder. A contractor has been hired to assist with final design and permitting this year. Jones River Landing is already impacted by sea level rise, with Northeasters being our greatest challenge. These pictures were taken in 2018 with five flood tides. The picture on the right is one mile downstream of the landing. The levee crossing the marsh is the MBTA train track to Plymouth. JRWA works with residents abutting this area to question proposed developments up against today's FEMA flood elevation. Funding is needed for the fish ladder project at Brockton's Dam including the replacement of the Lake Street culvert, evaluation and planning to remove the Stony Brook Dam, and capital improvements at the landing. Fish Ladder Project is underway at Forge Pond, Brockton's Dam, but we will need funding for construction and culvert replacement. We have obtained the promise of a hydro dredge to clear the fish channel and, and for use in other restoration projects in the Central Plymouth County Water District. Stony Brook flows out from Blackwater Swamp, a unique biological habitat of floating cedar bogs and black spruce. The swamp and pond abut town center and the baseball fields and is known for its triple E threats. Removal of this dam will help eels access Blackwater Pond and, uh, and the other four tributaries to contain mosquitoes and improve habitat health. A resiliency plan will be completed in June, and then we will evaluate the support necessary for making improvements that will promote education and stewardship of the river and bay resources for decades to come. Thank you. Please help us fully restore the Jones, which has done so much for our Commonwealth. All right, thank you to Pine and the Jones River Watershed Association. Now we are going to move to South Plymouth and hear from two organizations in the same area. We'll be hearing from the Herring Ponds Watershed Association, as well as we'll be hearing from Melissa Ferretti again from the Herring Ponds Wampanoag Tribe. Thank you for your attendance at today's Zoom meeting. My name is Don Williams. I'm President and Water Quality Committee Co-Chair for the Herring Ponds Watershed Association. Our watershed comprises 4,450 acres and 11 ponds. This map locates the Herring Ponds watershed. 
The blue outline shows the state designated area of critical concern, ACEC. Great Herring Pond is the home of Mass Maritime Academy Boathouse and to Port Camp Borndale. Our watershed association was founded in 2007. We have 270 members. Our mission statement is to preserve and protect the watershed land and water for future generations. We have been monitoring water quality in both Great and Little Herring Ponds since 2008. Picture on the right shows our all volunteer board of directors. We are very proud of our partnership with the town of Plymouth. Here board member Melissa Ferretti, who is also the Herring Pond Wampanoag chair lady, gives a blessing during this summer's dedication ceremony of the 54 acre Kamasa Kamkanet property. This property is in our watershed recharge area and our members raised nearly $50,000 to help Plymouth purchase it for conservation. Plymouth has been an excellent partner in water quality testing, runoff remediation, and financing a water quality plan, more about that later. In return, we have helped Plymouth sample and identify cyanobacteria in other Plymouth ponds. Our first area, our first ever cyanobacteria bloom occurred during the summer of 2020 and lasted two months. It was followed by a shorter one three weeks long last summer. The 2020 bloom was toxic and caused health problems. The 2021 summer outbreak was over more quickly. It was not toxic, but the trend is not good. More Plymouth ponds are experiencing toxic blooms that ruin the summer season. Fortunately for us, we are poised to partner with the town of Plymouth to finance an $80,000 water quality plan that will identify both the source of the phosphorus pollution and suggest ways to deal with it. Here, our consultant divers are about to take pond sediment samples. Runoff is one possible source of phosphorus pollution that may prove significant. Here, the homeowner has encouraged runoff by clear cutting trees and foliage down his slope to the pond, presumably to improve the view. We need help identifying the source of pollution causing cyanobacteria blooms and dealing with the blooms themselves. Treatment is very expensive. Upgrades and repairs of septic systems are also expensive. Our ponds will need significant help financially. Cyanobacteria plumes shut ponds down, sometimes for the entire summer. If allowed to continue, significant losses in property values and tax base will occur. Here, the contrast between normal and contaminated water is apparent. Plymouth DMEA has been an excellent partner identifying and remediating runoff sites. Fortunately, grants have been available. In addition, stronger state laws regulating clear cutting on properties next to waterways and use of wetlands need to be passed. Barnstable Clean Waters Coalition is undertaking a major nitro septic add-on project to reduce nitrogen in Barnstable's estuaries. We hope that there will soon be a similar system to remove phosphorus from the septic systems in freshwater environments. If so, homeowners will need financial help to reduce pollution. We ask for your help in allocating funds for this important step in preserving water quality in our southeastern Massachusetts area. My contact information is provided. Don't hesitate to give me a call or send me an email. Once again, thank you for your time, your attention, and your interest. The Herring Ponds Watershed Association is a proven good partner. Thank you, Don, and the Herring Ponds Watershed Association. Now we'll be hearing from the Herring Ponds Wampanoag tribe. about us. One of the remaining historic tribes in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts today, we are the Herring Pond Wampanoag. For thousands of years, we have continuously occupied this region. Of the historic tribes remaining in the Commonwealth today, 
a distinct and continuous tribal community the herring pond indians are the one and only tribe to have ever been allotted lands in the town of plymouth and born sadly a small fragment of what once was this pope's contact allotment map courtesy of the town of plymouth identifies the boundaries of the allotted reservation and common lands of the herring pond wampanoag tribe which surrounds our beloved watershed among our potawatomi people women are the keepers of the water we carry the sacred water to ceremonies and act on its behalf women have a natural bond with water because we are both life bearers my sister said we carry our babies in internal ponds and they come forth into the new world on a wave of water it is our responsibility to safeguard the water for all our relations robin wall kimmerer braiding sweetgrass indigenous wisdom scientific knowledge and teaching of plants among our potawatomi people women are to us all things living are our relatives I apologize. I'm not sure <laughs> where the audio is on this, um, but um, <laughs> that was our presentation from the Herring Ponds Wampanoag tribe, Melissa Ferretti. All right. Um, and now um, we are going to be hearing from, we're going to be moving on to the Cape um, and hearing from the Barnstable Clean Water Coalition. Good morning. My name is Casey Chatelaine, and I'm Deputy Director for Barnesville Clean Water Coalition. Our mission is to restore and preserve clean water throughout Barnesville. Much of our work is located in three bays in the town of Barnesville, which is pictured here. The watershed feeding three bays is outlined here in red. The reason why I'm showing all of Cape Cod and not just our watershed is because the problems we're working on and any successes we may have impact the whole region. What makes Cape Cod truly unique is the tourist basis of our economy. According to the Cape Cod Commission, over a third of our housing units are seasonal as the regional population almost doubles as people come from all over to swim, sail, shellfish, and otherwise enjoy our waters. Part of the good news for Three Bays is that the town of Barnstable does have a DEP approved comprehensive wastewater management plan. Three Bays is the watershed on the left hand side of the map with some of the red, green, and all of the yellow. Unfortunately, that color coding tells us that most of the watershed feeding Three Bays won't see municipal treatment for over a decade. As you can see in these images, we're already seeing a noticeable decline in water quality and conditions will just continue to worsen through time. This is why Barnesville Clean Water Coalition is pursuing projects such as innovative alternative septic systems. One of our major ongoing efforts is a cluster of enhanced IA systems meant to test these systems on an individual basis, as well as to test what happens to groundwater. However, the road to general use approval for these systems is quite lengthy. The most rigorous approval process in the country, in Massachusetts, systems need to have 50 in the ground for over three years to move from provisional use to general use. And that's after two years of up to 15 systems already in the ground. Our other major ongoing effort is a cranberry bog restoration at the headwaters of the Marston's Mills River. In support of this work, 
we were named as one of the first ever SNEP Pilot Watershed Initiative recipients, which will provide $750,000 in funding over five years. We have big plans for these cranberry bogs, and here's a sneak peek at conceptual design. But in front of us is a long and expensive road. Though the SNEP grant does provide quite a bit of funding, when all is said and done, it'll be a close to three to four million dollar project. So the big question is, what does our watershed and watersheds across Cape Cod need? And the short answer is funding. Funding to help make IAs more affordable, funding through the Massachusetts Alternative Septic System Test Center, and funding for wetlands restoration projects. It's extremely important to figure out IA funding for private homeowners and municipalities. People who may want to do the right thing aren't necessarily able to afford to put in an IA system. And certain municipalities that want to use IAs have reported coming into SRF roadblocks. Another important direction of funding is to the Massachusetts Alternative Septic System Test Center. While there are a few promising IA systems out there, MassTech needs some help so they continue testing so more enhanced IA systems become generally available. And lastly, funding needs to be directed to wetlands restoration projects. The Division of Ecological Restoration is a fantastic partner on our bog effort, but there's an immense amount of bog acreage across the region that can be restored for the same purpose. Funding would increase DER's capacity to help those efforts. And with that, Thank you for your time this morning. If you have any questions or want to chat at any time, my email address and phone number are here on the screen. Any help you can give us will benefit not just three bays, but the entire region. Thank you, Casey and the Barnstable Clean Water Coalition. Now we are going to move west and we're going to go to Narragansett Bay and save the bay. This is Topher Hamlet, Director of Advocacy for Save the Bay. Save the Bay's mission is to protect and improve Narragansett Bay. Our vision is a clean, healthy, fishable, swimmable Narragansett Bay accessible to all. We were founded in 1970 on the shores of Mount Hope Bay in Tiverton. Save the Bay advocates for policies and resources that will help Narragansett Bay and the people who depend on it. Our advocacy for the Bay is done with local partners in town halls, state houses, and in the halls of Congress. Our Explore the Bay Marine Science Education Program reaches nearly 20,000 students per year. The Narragansett Bay watershed covers over 1,700 square miles, and 60% of its land area is in Massachusetts. That includes the Blackstone River flowing southeast from Worcester and the Taunton River flowing southwest from Brockton to Mount Hope Bay. The Taunton River is the largest source of fresh water to Narragansett Bay. Narragansett Bay supports hundreds of species of fish, shellfish, plants, birds, and marine animals. It's a working bay supporting marine trades, aquaculture, ports, fishing, and shellfishing. 40 years ago, Upper Narragansett Bay and Mount Hope Bay were badly polluted with industrial waste and raw sewage that were choking its waters and harming marine life. But the bay has enjoyed a comeback. Its waters are at their cleanest and healthiest in decades. The reason is the people of Rhode Island and southeastern Massachusetts have made it a priority, but challenges and threats remain. Some of our rivers are hampered by obstructions by now obsolete dams and undersized culverts. This has blocked fish like alewife from swimming upstream to spawn, and it's choked waters with decaying plants. But there have been successes, such as the removal of dams from the Mill River in Taunton. Another concern is nitrogen and phosphorus from wastewater treatment plants that are causing impairment of the Taunton River in Mount Hope Bay. This has been going on for a long time now. But Taunton and Brockton have up, are upgrading their wastewater plants to reduce this kind of pollution. Fall River in Somerset still need to do this work. Third concern is the loss of wetlands along the coast and inland. Coastal marshes are sinking, dying in place as sea levels rise. 
Freshwater wetlands have been damaged and lost and are now under more pressure from development. But there are successes we can build on. The town of Dighton is now managing the Broad Cove Marsh for long-term viability. Freshwater wetlands restoration is being done by the Massachusetts Department of Ecological Restoration at places like the Millbrook Bogs, a former cranberry production site in Freetown. Save the Bay has three main funding priorities and opportunities for the legislature to consider. One is financing of wastewater tre treatment system upgrades. Fall River and Somerset both need to remove nitrogen from their wastewater discharge. And Fall River needs to complete the combined sewer overflow project to end raw sewage discharges to the Taunton River and Mount Hope Bay. The second one is stormwater infrastructure upgrades for both clean water and for flood control. We now can use green infrastructure using plants and soils to absorb rainwater as a viable way to manage stormwater in communities. The third one is climate adaptation projects to help the Taunton River and Mount Hope Bay communities adapt to climate, impact, climate change impacts in three ways. One, by securing land for marshes to migrate upland and inland as waters rise. Two, restoring the natural flow of rivers with bigger culverts and with removing dams. And the third is to purchase undeveloped forested land to keep the watershed cool as temperatures rise, secure habitat for wildlife, and protect water quality from expected development that will come with MBTA's South Coast Rail Expansion Project. There are federal funds available for water infrastructure and climate work. The Commonwealth can make the most of the opportunity, first by allocating federal monies to the capital intensive wastewater projects and using state funds to leverage federal support for these other projects. Thank you for listening to Save the Bay. And my contact information is on the final. Sorry. <laughs> well, thank you, Topher and Save the Bay. I can bring that last part back up, but um, uh, thank you. I hit the, I was, I was hovering to, <laughs> and I hit it by mistake, but that was Topher Hamlet of um, Save the Bay. We have one uh, additional presentation, which is uh, just an introduction to the Taunton River watershed. Um, so I will uh, pull that up for everybody. Um, and then I hear that Senator Sear is here, so uh, we'll be able to hear from him. Oh, hey, Sarah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm gonna have to go soon. So, okay, then you can speak now if you'd like. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I apologize. All right, can, let me, no problem. Yeah. Let me, let me just introduce you quickly um, sure. and, then, and then you can go. All right. So um, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Senator Julian Sear, who serves uh, in the Senate representing Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket. Um, <laughs> served on, I'll just say you served on a bunch of committees. Um, <laughs> um, and I had the pleasure of serving with you on the uh, Special uh, Massachusetts Special Commission on Ocean Acidification, um, which was a really fun and interesting project. Um, so I'll let you speak so you can get on your way. Sure. I thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate that. And again, apologies. Um, this is actually one of the first days. I, I, we're back in the building, and and we like really had it down right the logistics of like when your life is just Zoom meetings. And and now um, I was at an event at City Hall and getting back up here. So I, I, I apologize. Um, for uh, for the legislative uh, the the scheduling switching, um, anyway, it's so good to be with all of you for um, this state of the waters conversation, and I really want to thank um, the Barnesville Clean Water Coalition uh, for inviting me to participate, um, and and the whole host of organizations here. You know, look, I, I represent a, a corner of the world, a corner of the Commonwealth that is, um, you know, water is sort of essential to who we are, right? It's it's um, the proximity to water and our pristine, you know marine and freshwater environment is why many of us choose to make a life on the Cape and Islands. Um, and it's also sort of the product we sell in the global marketplace, right? People are coming to um, to Cape Cod, to Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, particularly in the summer months, but year round for our pristine waters or, or our alleged pristine waters. Um, and, and what's really been clear um, is that we've not done a good job in stewardship broadly um, on Cape Cod and on the islands. A lot of that's been our real failure to um, address wastewater, uh, our own wastewater, and um, we've not good, done a good job there historically. Um, and so I've been really proud to have worked with a whole host of partners, um, including the Bonsport Bons Clean Water Coalition, uh, Association of Preserve Cape Cod, and a whole host of other environmental organizations 
um, as well as working with the business community, Representative Sarah Peake and the entire legislative delegation to establish the Cape and Islands Water Protection Fund. Um, this is a, uh, a fund dedicated to basically using room occupancy dollars to provide resources for um, wastewater infrastructure to date. Um, over $25 million in the first two years of the fund has been realized. Uh, it's probably one of the most significant things that I will have worked on in my legislative career. Um, and we got that done and signed it to law in 2018. Uh, and, and it's already being put to work. And that's just going to make a world of difference in really cleaning up our waters. Um, really excited about alternative septic. Uh, I know very, very sort of sexy issue, um, but a real essential one, particularly for those of us like me who are from rural communities. You don't know if Toro will ever have sort of a large scale sewer. Um, they actually need to have a sewer like sort of on that beach point portion that goes into Provincetown. But, you know, if you live in other parts of the town, um, alternative septic septic systems, um, you know, are, are, I think are, are, are really promising. And again, you know, the work that the Barnesville Clean Water Coalition is doing absolutely fabulous in figuring this out. Um, and then finally, you know, we can't talk about water without talking about um, per and polyalkali, fluoroalkali substances, uh, PFAS. Um, this is something that, that really has been a challenge, uh, yes, in drinking water and, and yes, in, um, you know, uh, the rest of our natural environment. Um, I've been leading, uh, co-leading a task force with Kate Hogan uh, to, to really sink our teeth into this issue. Um, we're working on a final report and that should be, be forthcoming. So I'm grateful to, to Leader Hogan for, um, you know, her partnership here. And I think that's something we're hoping to get done. So, uh, and then of course, ocean acidification, which Sarah mentioned, um, we got some fabulous legislation that came out of that, uh, that task force as well. So I don't want to take too much airtime. Um, I'm just grateful to have been invited and really, you know, thank you for the work that, that y'all do um, each and every day. It's absolutely essential. And, and for Cape Codders and Islanders, um, clean water is, is, is how we sustain ourselves uh, in so many ways. And so just thank you for your advocacy. Um, and again, uh, appreciation for the flexibility. Thank you so much, Senator Sear. We really appreciate you. Uh, you, you coming. I, and I hope that the rest of your day is not quite as hectic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it comes in the territory, right? <laughs> thank you so much. Good to be with you. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. So um, if you are uh, going to be hanging on for the legislative workshop, um, please do hang on. We have we do have one small presentation left from uh, the Taunton River Watershed Alliance, um, and then we will get right into that workshop. Um, we will briefly stop recording between the two sections uh, just to make sure that we have separate recordings. All right, so on that note, uh, let's get into uh, learning a little bit about the Taunton. This meeting is being recorded. Hello, I'm Gloria Bancroft, and I'm here today to represent the Taunton River Watershed Alliance. Who are we? The Alliance was formed in 1988 to be a strong voice for the Taunton River and its watershed. The Taunton River received a wild and scenic federal designation in 2009. We are quite a large watershed covering 562 square miles from Fall River to north of Brockton, with over a dozen major tributary rivers and seven wastewater treatment plants. 20 cities and towns lie entirely in our watershed, with an additional 23 that lie in portions of the watershed for a total of 46 communities. What do we do? We remain committed to our water quality monitoring program with 20 test locations. We are entering our seventh season in our Diamondback Terrapin population monitoring program, as well as the Nest Protection Program. We advocate for sustainable development and responsible stewardship within our communities. And lastly, we find ways to connect our residents to the river with various events, such as our Taunton River Summer Festival, canoe kayak trips, angler education days, and more. Thank you for your time and participating in today's event. All right. And with that, we have gone through all of our watershed associations and watershed alliances and coalitions. Um, and I really appreciate um, all of uh, the various members contributing uh, your presentations. Um, I would like to thank everybody for coming. It's been wonderful to hear everybody's priorities. Um, hopefully they've given you some things to think about. 
Um, you know, there are common threads between all of us in terms of water quality and water quantity and connectivity, but because of the unique watersheds of Massachusetts and uh, the things that make us all unique, each of our organizations does have our individual needs as well. Um, so it's been interesting to hear those. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, I hope that for those of you who are going to speak to your legislators, that you have some successful and fruitful discussions. And for those who are staying for the workshop, like I said, please hang on um, and we will get going with that very soon. So thank you, thanks again. And thank you to our coordinator, Wendy Garpo. Hey, thank you, Sarah, thank you. And um, Sarah, I um, uh, Catherine Lang and I are thinking that maybe we should take maybe a two, three minute break to, uh, um, refill our waters and our coffees and maybe uh, have a bathroom break and then resume in a few minutes for the um, advocacy workshop that Catherine will, will be leading. Sounds wonderful. Sound so good? we'll see everybody back here in just a couple minutes. Thank about you. 1120. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs>